I'm Peter Brown from Tiny and Sons Glass. Tiny and Sons Glass was established in 1978 with my father and brother and I. We're at 575 Washington Street in Pembroke. We're certified and qualified to do all your windshield replacement and repair. Tiny and Sons Glass is a community-based business. We have 12 mobile vans that come to you. If the weather's bad, you can come here to the shop. We have a nice waiting area, TV, Wi-Fi, kid-friendly, pet-friendly. We also can move about 15, 20 cars a day through the shop. Perfect for you when the weather's bad. So come on down to Tiny and Sons Glass if you need your windshield replaced or repaired. Tiny and Sons Glass, 1-888-64-TINYS. Just call. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, Board of Select, Pembroke Board of Selectmen's uh, meeting tonight, this uh, December 4th, um, 2017, and we'll start with a Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we have Kathleen Keegan from the Chamber of Commerce that's going to... Oh, you're not? No, from the Pembroke Tree Lighting. Oh, I thought that they sent you in to talk about your business from the they Chamber. They did, but I'm not um, in the... Okay. Okay, you want to get up and tell yeah. us about your tree lighting then? Yeah. Hi, yes, yeah, so I am the chairperson for the Pembroke Tree Lighting. So we are a group of Pembroke citizens, and our mission is to put on one of Pembroke's best events. Um, we want to make it a creative, fun, free, um, or extremely affordable, uh, safe holiday event. And I feel like we knocked it out of the park. Um, so this year, what we did, we to me it's like that Norman Rockwell scene. We had um, kids dressed up or bundled in strollers. We had hot cocoa with all the fixings from the uh, Pilgrim Skate Club. We were decorating cookies sponsored by Protecta Wire, um, trucks to climb on, uh, horse-drawn carriage uh, or horse-drawn rides, which um, we had gorgeous Clydesdales. We haven't had um, horses for several years, so that was awesome to have the horses this year. We had a little petting zoo, so next year, Sabrina, you can come see that. Uh, we had a moon bounce. We have holiday voltives that kids could uh, walk away with. We had a photo booth, so they had, um, again, free, uh, these beautiful pictures of themselves with their families. Um, roasting marshmallows over fire pits by the, uh, sponsored by the Halifax Pembroke Lions Club. Um, padding holiday rabbits, kids games, and uh, frozen holiday characters roaming around by Turn the Page Entertainment. The Historical Society Museum opened their doors and they served an awesome cider, apple cider, it was delicious. They also had story time up there um, by the Pembroke librarian, Melissa McCleary, uh, so that was adorable. We had a water station sponsored by Bridgewater Savings. We had a live nativity, so at the other end of the, um, the green we had uh, meet Jesus and Mary and lots of wise men, actually I think there were three. <laughs> Um, the first church um, did the concession stand for us, so really affordable. They had grilled cheese, they had hot dogs, they had um, uh, chowder, all these great fixings. Um, and then um, Santa arrived at 5 o'clock as he normally does and lit the trees, so that magical moment. Um, this year was, unfortunately, we didn't, weren't able to light all the trees. Uh, I guess we found out there's an issue with the, um, the town. Um, town green with getting the trucks on it. So hopefully we can work with the different departments and maybe come up with some solutions for next year on how to do that. Um, and then immediately following Santa's arrival, we had singing carols by the high school choir and band. So this is a little different from years in the past. Usually the high school choir would be on from four to five, and then Santa would come in, light the lights, and then everyone leaves at five o'clock and when we just um, lit the trees. This way they were, um, everyone was standing underneath the, the new lit trees. So it's kind of a cool thing watching all the kids play on the town green with all the lights on the trees. Um, and one of the new things we added this year was the snowman on the green contest. So I don't know if you've noticed the uh, town green, but we have about 24 snowmen um, on there. It was a, a great contest we had. People could buy a snowman for $25 and they decorated it and um, we put them on the town green and we had um, a, a group of folks voting on the different ones. So our winners were um, Best Buddies was in um, third place. 
um, from uh, Best Buddies of Pembroke High School. Second place was Elvis. He was, um, an, uh, that was by the artist of New England Village. And then the, the uh, winner was uh, Jerry uh, Jean Garini. She did this amazing mermaid. It looked like there were like tin cans on it. So, and she had it all lit up. So next year we want to do something a little different. We'll do the same contest, but maybe with gingerbread. So um, again, awesome event. Um, we also had, we placed ribbons on the veterans tree for folks who ha are serving that have a Pembroke connection. Um, that's sponsored by the Pembroke Military Support Group. And um, even though this isn't necessarily a town event, we really appreciate all the support that you folks give this, um, you know, the Pembroke tree lighting folks, um, especially you, the selectmen, um, the DPW who put the lights up for us, um, the police and the fire who get Santa there. Just, you know, we really appreciate it. It helps us um, make this event even more special. So, um, and we had a recap meeting last night, so we're going to figure out what we want to add for next year. And um, I do want to give a shout out to this committee because it's many hands make light work. So we have Penny Wynn, Pat Lynch, Lorraine and Jay LaRocca, um, Rhonda Pollies, Lisa McLaughlin, Kyle Harney, PJ Lowe, Heather McLaughlin, Pat Ahern, Leanne De uh, Leanna Delaney. And there's always room for more. So, <laughs> so if anyone's interested, they can certainly contact me, Kathleen at realestaterocks.com. And uh, they can also check out, we're going to be loading up some photos from this year's event on PembrokeTreeLighting.com. And our next event is going to be Pembroke's largest water balloon fight, which will be the, day at, uh, the first day of summer vacation for the kids. So that's it from me. You have any questions? No, I, I personally I don't know if anybody on the board does, but I think you do a terrific job up there. And yeah. It's uh, nice that you and your group do that. So. All the time. Yeah, we love it. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's just a, a magical, like I said, it, it feels like Norman Rockwell. So. And whenever anybody says that to me, like, oh, it was Norman Rockwell, I'm like, yes, that makes my day. <laughs> So. No, it, it was a it was a fun event, and uh, you could just uh, feel the Christmas spirit. Yeah, so it was, it and was I feel great like each year it gets bigger and bigger. So, yeah, and so you have the program that uh, we we put out. So it's yeah. it's a lot, but yeah. Again, thank you for your support, and we hope to see you next year, the first Sunday in December. All right. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 7 o'clock is Margaret Struzik on <coughs> early non-Medicare eligible retirees health insurance rates. Judge and I will be for you uh, sometime in September um, before we brought this subject up. And um, when we left the meeting, we were told it would be a couple of weeks. I know Ed's had some health, family issues. I've had some family issues, and we're just getting back here now to see if you've talked about the discussion. You had a discussion about this group and where we're going to move from here with it. Anybody have any comments on it? Uh, these, these people have gone now. They're going into the seventh month of paying <laughs> the escalated rate. They're looking at you, looking at another increase in January and another increase in July, which is going to put these guys at 20% of their pensions. The health insurance premiums, it's, it's not, I know the last four people who walked out of this building recently went upstairs and went into Treasury Collector's office and asked how much they will be paying, what percentage will they be paying for the health insurance. And they were told 15% till you hit 65 and I, like I said before, I think it's just, it's unconscionable that we, we make people pay 20% of their, 20% of their health, their pensions on health insurance. I know they're limited to what they get for raises. I know I got my Social Security letter today. I got a 2% raise. I made $4.50. My Social Security is $178 a month. So they're not living large. They're living on their pensions. And as George told you, most of them, are at this at this point poverty level pensions. Forty four percent are at the poverty level or below. For their pensions. So I'm not talking about a wealthy group of people. We aren't. So we're coming here, see if we can get some relief or bring them back to the ruling that we made back in two thousand and six. Which is what a lot of them a lot of them went out on. It was um, they go out at fifteen fifteen yeah. percent. 
the people who were retired at the time went to 15 percent. Everybody else went out at the rate they'd be paying when they leave. And that was that's been past practice since 2006, and it got changed this July. Who on the board has uh, taken a deep look in, at this? Pardon me, I didn't hear. Who on the who on the board, <clears throat> or has been on uh, town administrator, to take a, take a deeper look into this? What action has happened? What thoughts have happened since these folks were before us in September? In answer to Dan's question, uh, I've had some conversations with Ed, and uh, Mike Buckley was good enough to speak to me uh, a month or so ago, um, and I spoke to Kathleen um, on it as well. And the, the only thing I see in, in um, you know, the inequity of it all is that aside from Hanson, who was on a 90-10 basis, uh, Pembroke is the next lowest at um, 81.19 and I, I see where they're coming from and frankly I'm probably going to be there myself in the next couple of years um, but I, I don't know how we in, in fairness to people who are going out now um, you know how we make it equitable to the people that are already out Did I make that clear as mud? Uh, so, as the way I, I have thought of this is is that the, the folks that have retired uh, within the last year or two um, have seen the seen the effort on, on the part of the board of selectmen to to increase the. Um, the amount that the workers pay, yeah, I uh, but the folks that have been out for for years and years and years, um, but they did, that's they that's the discussion I think should be before us. But the the guys who are out for years, their health insurance is not frozen. They get the increases. They get the monetary premium increase that everybody else gets. It's not like their health insurance is frozen. They get every increase that any active employee gets they get on the premium this is a participation rate increase that they're getting on top of the premium increase right mm -hmm. I, I, I understand the um, mm -hmm. the issue before us it's a lot of money it's a lot you're talking you're talking on a 20 or 25 thousand dollar pension you're talking 500 dollars a month that's a lot of money when, they, when like i said the last time the first thing you want to know how much am i going to get paid how much am I paying for my insurance? When you pay out, you want to know what my pension is and how much of money am I paying on my insurance? And we changed it on them. Can I can I just ask you a question? Yeah, aren't most of these people that went out out on disability? No, no, there's, they're there's not. A, no, they're they're people. I don't know. I asked to see the list, and I'm, I'm not privy to the list. There are some people who are on disability. <coughs> there are some people who have not reached 65 yet. And there are some people who, even though they are 65, will never be eligible for Medicare. So it's everybody who's out and not on Medicare. So but once they hit Medicare. Yeah, but I just think being fair to everybody, everybody in the town has gone to 25%. Uh, most all of the people in the school department have been at 25% for a long time. They get paid a heck of a lot more and than people that sit in this building. Well, they probably get paid a lot more than the people who went out on disability, but they also get disability insurance. Um, they get a disability retirement from the town because they're all done. In, in all deference to you, the so, disability retirement to the town is not the same to, as the police and fire disability. As a police and fire disability, and I know because my husband looks at it as a disability. It is not a town employee disability. It is not what police and fire disability. A town employee's disability is 60 percent of their pay before taxes. It's not. It's not a tax-free pension. Right. I think it comes out to 62 percent or something like that. I believe it's 60. Yeah. yeah. And and they don't pay taxes. Yes, they do. Yes, they do. Um, 
No, that's you not have what your I... belief, you have to leave, though, you have to go out on a job injury to pay. Well, why did they go out then? This, is what, road this road is what I don't understand. Sometimes. As far as the disabilities, I think, I believe there's probably three mm. people on a disability pension. The other 18 will cover that. I'm told this 22. Right, but if they work if they work for the town mm -hmm. and they went out on a disability, um, then they're getting they're getting a disability from the town from the retirement, yes, which they, they don't have yes, to pay. Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So they're making up on on that one end, but everybody else's insurance that had worked for the town has gone up. Doesn't matter whether you're police, fire, school, no, it doesn't. What, whatever it is. No, it's, it doesn't. But I don't I think. If you look at it this way, we all know what people are making nowadays. Nobody's going out on a $20,000 pension anymore. Nobody. Um, to take people who went out on those pensions and make them pay 20% of their pension to, to cover the health insurance when they were guaranteed when they went out what their rate would be. Well, this is a this is what I'm a little confused about. That <coughs> that when I look at the what was what was done here was. Mm -hmm. um, they said that um, when they went out, they were going to be paying 15%, but that's what they were paying. 15% or what you were paying when you go out. Some of these people paid 5% when they went out. Some of these people were wrong with 5%. And we took them, in 2005, we took them from 10% <coughs> to a 15%, which was a 50% hike in their, in their health insurance. And then the next year, they wanted to do them another 5%, which would have been 100% higher in health insurance. That's why we did this. And if we, that's why I asked for it. If we had done just what I asked, all I asked to do was grandfather in, not grandfather in, but hold the insurance to the 17 people that were there. The vote of the selectmen changed it to the 17 people who were there, and everybody else who retires after that goes out at the rate they were retired at. So if anybody was retired at 20 percent, they, they were paying 20 percent. You know what I mean? If you, the people who were there in 2006 on paid 15 percent. If somebody went out at 19 percent, they're paying 19 percent. That's the question that I have, uh, and uh, I don't think it was made clear to me, or I didn't ask the question right, perhaps. But are you saying that if somebody goes out on retirement and they're at 80-20, that they stay at 80-20 yes. for a time immemorial? Yeah, until they, it's, until they were eligible for Medicare. And some people aren't. Yeah, until they were eligible for Medicare. Uh, two think, people. Yeah, two, two people, people that aren't eligible for Medicare. Yeah. And they never will be because they just didn't. My understanding is you have to have worked under the system and they were always DPW reported, so they never get It's too bad. Everybody else will age out. So I think one of the questions is, do you know that people that are over 65 pay more for their health insurance? Absolutely they do. They do. Right. Yeah. So do you think it's fair for somebody that's under 65? you got two people, you're going to do it on their back. Pardon? you got two people who will never get Medicare. So, but what about everybody else? Once they hit 65, they're going to be paying the right. same bucks that all the rest of us are paying. So, so do you think that it's fair for somebody that's under 65 to pay less in health insurance than somebody that's over 65? They all do. Every, every working person who's under 65 pays less than when you hit 65. My husband and I were paying $140 combined when we were working. Once we hit 65, we're paying close to 500 Four fifty five to be exact. Yeah, four fifty five. Close to five hundred. Yeah, four fifty five. So the person the couple that is under sixty five pays a hundred and thirty seven dollars yep. less a month than somebody that's over sixty five. Yep. And that and that is if they were at fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. Right now at nineteen percent, they still pay fifty two dollars. At 19%, they still pay $52 less a month yep. than a couple that's over 65. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard. Like I said, I've got my Social Security card. It's my Social Security card. I've got a 2% raise. I'm up to $178 a month. 
That's what my take home Social Security pays. So this is this is big. This is a big ticket item to these people. This is not, you know, let's go out to dinner. This is a big ticket item. And they were when you go up to the treasurer collector's office and you say, how much am I going to pay on my on my retirement? And they say my retirement health insurance, and they say 15% to you, 65. Well, you're going out, understanding you're going to pay 15% to you, 65. And that's been the past practice for the last 11 years. Well. But then that was voted on by the board to go to 19%. 19, then 22, and then 25 in a year and a mm -hmm. half. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, what happens to somebody if they go out and it's a, um, a couple that is retired and make it a sexist comment that the wife is the homemaker and the husband was working for the town in whatever department? If he continues to work and she's retired. Are they paying a split fee or are they still on his insurance? Once they get 65, you have to go with single insurance. Doesn't make a difference whether you're. If, if the husband is still working for the town, if it's a town employee, as long as the person who carries the health insurance is working for the town, they stay in the plan and they follow the person who's working for the town. In the case of they're both working and the, the wife is carrying the insurance, as an example. If the wife is working in the town. All right, if she's not. Um, if you're not. Are I they entitled to get in at some point, or if she should pass away, God forbid? If she should pass away, all right, so if she's working. She's carrying the insurance. If they're 65, I don't, I don't know that. I, I, I can't give you an answer, I'm not sure. Now, the town adopted a surviving spouse statute several years ago. So that way, if the one of the spouses that, or the spouse that was carrying the insurance passes away, the surviving spouse is entitled to, to, to the insurance. And at that was the, passed at by the rate county. that they had, or at the rate that was set by the town? The rate that's set by the town. Yeah, that's what my wife pays. Mm -hmm. My wife pays. Because I'm over 65, yeah, and my wife has to pay for her own, and she's still cheap on the independent. Over, if you were still cheap over there, your wife could still be covered by your insurance. Right, but not at 65. At mm. 65, that's it. Mm. Yeah. No, but I know I'm telling you it is, because at 65, you're, you're out of there. Oh, you're, you're out of there. But as my case, yeah. I worked here till I was 67. My husband stayed on, I stayed on the town insurance till I was 67. I didn't have to go right, to but it. I think what we were trying to do in here was make it fair for everybody because if, I think well, if we, I think it, it, I think if you change your mind and turn around and say now, okay, we're going to put everybody back to 15%, to then what's going to happen to all the other town employees that were here that are going to say, well, I want to go back to 15% too. It says right at the original thing, the original vote taken was, Everybody pays 15% until you hit 65 or the rate you're paying when you leave. So if I was making, I was paying 17% when I left, I'd be paying 17% now. The track though is that... It was, of, it was a part of all of the... You'd just be paying 17% of a higher number. Right. And, they do, and they do get, they get the, min, they get the increases at every time for you. They get those increases every year. But what would be equal, what would be fair, is to tell everybody in town, if one group's going to pay 20% for their health insurance, everybody pays 20% for their health insurance. That's what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get everybody to pay 25. You, well, no, you're, you're trying to get everybody to pay a flat 25%. But 25% of these people who went out being told how much they were going to pay till the 65, that 25% brings them to 20% of their retirement. 25% of their retirement is not 25% of my retirement or Sabrina's retirement or any of you guys' retirement. Look at the books. No, but my 25% isn't 25% of what I'm retiring at either. That's what I'm saying. I know. Right, because that's that's a different pay schedule that I was on. Yeah, but that's but that's Medicaid. That's not covered by the town. Once you 65 retired, that's state-mandated Medicaid. The Medicaid, you've got to pay 25%. You have to. You don't have a choice about it. With this, we had a choice about it. We chose to be 
he chose to take into consideration his low pension people. Well, ten well years because ago. because you're on Medicaid doesn't mean that the town has to that you have to pay the town's twenty five percent. That was something that the town decided. No, Medicare is a state. Medicare is state. Everybody who's on Medicaid has to pay all senior plans at twenty five percent. There's no getting away from twenty five percent on senior plans. Uh, I don't know. I think there's still some unanswered questions that I, that I have. I talked to Kathleen also. I didn't talk to Mike Buckley about it, but um, I don't know. I mean, I I think I think you're right in a way that if you retire and somebody says that this is what you pay, um, maybe that's what it should be. But but we were trying to be fair to all of the town employees but and anybody the in the future but that's going to go. the town employees who come in, now, in here now know the rules. They know the rules. They can read the rules. The rules say you'll pay 25% of your health insurance now and when you retire. You will pay 25% of your health insurance. That isn't what they were told. It isn't what they were told. They were told you'll pay 15% until you get Medicare eligibility. That's what they were told. That's well, what they went over. So, one thing that that I, I think should be made clear uh, for us, for you, and the people that are listening, is that it, they were they were told in 2006 mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, by the vote of the board of selectmen at that time to re remain the retirees to remain at 15 percent, uh, and anyone going forward after 2006 now. Mm -hmm were going to go out at what they were paying at the time. But there's a, there was a whole discussion going back as far as 2006 that made it clear that it's, it's a, it is a Board of Selectmen decision. And it, 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 it's whether, whether they were told in 2006 or not, it's, it's still a Board of Selectmen's decision to, to raise it beyond the, the 15%. Now, knowing that it's our decision, uh, it's a hard decision. Exactly. You know, what do we do? Yeah. So I just want to—I just want to get away from. I, know I just want to get away from. They were told 15 percent, so it's set in stone. It is not set in stone. It's—it's it's a vote of this board. But it's tough when the last four people. That's the—that's the argument. Yeah. That's where we're at. We're at. I just want to make sure. I mean, some of these people. The process that we're thinking of. Some of these is people. In those very lines. recent retirees who were told 15 percent. Right. And like I said, it's—it's. It's, I know it's a moral decision. I know it's yeah. not a. I know it's a moral decision. I think to to look at somebody and say, well, you worked for the town for 37 years or 32 years or 25 years, and now we're going to kick you when you can't do anything about it? No. What do you think about half of the South Shore towns that require their retirees to pay 50%? But those retirees were told that when they retired. I, that's, a, that's a decision you have to make. When but you some of these towns are making these decisions now. You know, some exactly. managers have told me they're planning on raising these rates within the next couple of years as well. How do you, how, I don't, under, I know you have to balance the budget. I did health insurance. When I started doing health insurance, it was 350000 a month. I know it's over a million dollars a month. I know that. But this was a, this was a bargain you made with these guys. This was a bargain you made with the employees. If you, if you need to, and I understand having to balance the budget. Then there's got to be a fair way to balance the budget. If you're going to make one group of people pay 25 to 20 percent for the health insurance, then everybody pays 20 percent for the health insurance. 20 percent of you pay for the health insurance. See, that was, that was one of the things that we had in negotiations was um, <clears throat> when you have negotiations with all of the unions that, and the non-union people that are in the town, it's like, well, the school is paying 25%, and they've been paying 25% for the, years, you look at right? The, the bill, I'm going to so, tell you, there are girls working where I worked. They started in the office I was in. They were with the school department making almost $20,000 more than the people that are still sitting That's in the, the job, school. though. You can't go by that. It is the job. It's the secretary's job. We don't get those yeah, raises over you, here. You can't, you can't go by that, though. Bill, we don't get those raises over here. I know, but it's the same as, as a police chief or a patrolman. So how can you make it the same for both of them? It well, isn't they, because they the they're making more money. But they took the jobs under those. They took the jobs knowing how much they were going to pay for their health insurance. And maybe that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is we, where I've worked here 
25, 30 years, 25 years, we've taken constant hikes in our health insurance. You may balance the budget by taking 1% hike in the health insurance in the school. We've taken, we've. Yeah, but look at all of the years that, that, that the secretaries that were here were paying less than the 25%, which they, which everybody they were. Was, everybody was paying less than 25%. Yeah. Yeah, everybody the, was. The DBW was way down. They were at 17% or everybody, whatever it was, and they were way down. Everybody was, everybody's. And the police are at a different scale, and the fire are at a different mm -hmm. scale. And mm -hmm. what we're trying to do is be fair to everybody. I know And you unfortunately, know. it's, you know, it's something that these retirees or people that left before they were 65 just to go out, just to retire before 65. It's, you know, I mean, I feel for them, but that's a decision that they made to leave on their own. It wasn't a decision that they had to leave. Not all of them left on if their it's, own. Some if of them, it's, they, they aged out, they, some of them were injured, I, you know, it's, Yeah, I, I mean, the ones, the ones that were injured um, that went out on a disability, I know they're getting disability insurance and they don't pay taxes on a I disability. Don't, I don't know what disability well, if I'm working on the police and I get hit by a car when I'm doing a traffic job out someplace oh, and I, I go out, I, thought you meant something I get my pay. Pension. Yeah, in other words, I get 62% of my pay or whatever. I don't get the 80% as if I mm -hmm. stayed on the job. Mm -hmm. But on, on the fair side of that is I don't pay taxes either. And there's certain benefits that you get because you're disabled. So it, it's, um, just that's, it's supposed to wash out. It's supposed to you know, that, that whole thing is like not that. Your bill, nothing washes out when you make twenty twenty five thousand dollars a year. Then you should get a different job. If you don't want to make twenty five thousand dollars a year, I mean that's probably what my wife makes a year. That's what I make a year. So <laughs> it's that's just yeah. what she's decided to do. She's she's not well, out in the corporate they, I know, but this is what they world decided. making a hundred thousand dollars a year, so but that's I know that though, but I'm just saying I just think it's unconscionable that yeah. you're gonna make some pay twenty percent of their pension. Health insurance. When it's a group that's going to age out. I know all mine's gone up considerably. And, there's a, there's and, like that, and that's I'm on Medicare. There's so. that too. There's a going up. There's a not frozen. They have, they've taken every, every insurance rate out of the insurance rate hike that everybody else has taken. Yeah. Well, they haven't taken the percentage. They took, they took a 50 percent. They took a 50 percent hike in 2006. They did. They went from a 10% to a 15%, which is 50% Yeah, but that's, I mean, talking about 10 or 15 years ago or whatever, compared to what somebody's making today is altogether different. When I first started, right. I only made 25 cents an hour, so if I can't go back to what I made, I'm not, I'm you know, just, when I'm, I, you I'm know, asking it's, for, it's I'm what asking, you're making today. I'm just asking to... I know the police officers are making a heck of a lot more than I was making well, you when say, I was there. Wish you were there now. Yeah, I mean, it would be great. I know. Get yeah. a little retroactive would be wonderful, yeah. but I, it's just that you know we so talk not going to happen. That's just that's just yeah. the way things are. Started up in September, and you guys. Said I don't know. I just think we're trying to be reasonable about the whole thing, and and it's. Um, but the people who are working now know we're going to be reasonable. They know we're going to be. They know they're going to be at twenty five percent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the uh, yes. question I have, I'm a little confused about this. Uh, Dan has stated correctly that this board has the authority mm -hmm. to set the rates, okay? Uh, now, I believe you were saying that when people retired, they were told 15%. They were given 15%. letters. They were given letters. Well, who, would, who would be telling them it, what their the, insurance was going to be? Right here. They went go, you go, well, Everyone who's retired in the last, the last four people that I know retired. John Barrett Warner, um, Kevin Betts, Gina Fahey, um, Scotty Manning, and all went into the treasurer collector's office and asked how much they're going to be paying. Where would they get the information that they were going to pay 15 percent? Yeah, because that, that was past practice. There was never any question about this. When I left, that's what everybody was paying. Um, when the first word, in, the first time I ever heard there was a question about it was when John Barragonis retired. He went in to ask, and they told him 17 percent. 
So then he hunted around and his shop steward said, no, it's 15%. Here's the paperwork, it's 15%. So they had to walk him back to 15%. So because John did that, everybody else knew. You go up and you ask before you leave. I know Gina Fahey retired, she asked if she takes care of a handicapped daughter, 15%. So it wasn't very important to her. She wasn't going, you know Janet, you know how important it was to Janet. She wasn't going home to play, you know, she was going home, she retired to take care of a handicapped daughter. She was told 15% to your 65. Um, Scotty Manning retired not that long ago. He went out on a, I don't know whether he's out on a disability pension. He's paying his health insurance, he's paying his uh, Medicare because he needs to have kidney dialysis. He will lose his house if this goes through. He walked into Kathleen's office and said, how much am I going to put percentage of my name? He was told 15%. They were all retired before the Board of Selectmen voted to go to 19%. Yes. So at the time, it was 15%. they were paying 15%. Okay. Yep. And I don't know how long Scott, how long has Scott been retired? Did They've all been retired since before July 1st. Yeah, July 1st. Yeah. So, I mean, how do you go out on July 1st, before July 1st, thinking you're going to pay 15, and now you get a letter after July 1st saying, by next July, you're going to be up to 25. That's what they're all getting hit with. And that's, you know, that's, that's the problem. That's the door. I think, I think we're a better town than we used to be. We used to be a better town. We used to, we used to, in fact, when you talk about negotiations, when we sat and negotiated this health insurance without the school, I would tell you, it was just the town employees who negotiated the new health insurance rates and stuff like that. We, I think I said, we sat with every one of you except for Matthew, we, it might have been Greg Hamlin. And we all sat in this room, we negotiated health insurance, and at the end of those negotiations, the employees, decided to take a little bit harder hit because they brought up these late retirees, the early retirees. We brought them up and said, what are we going to do with them? Because George stood up and he said, who's going to represent my guys? Because I won't be here. I'm not here on a day-to-day -day basis. How do I know my guys are going to be taken care of? So we took a little bit bigger hit to protect these people. And you all guys thought that was great. You gave us a big attitude for protecting those people. So we, we took a little bit hard to hit on our health. Well, it probably wasn't us. It was somebody no, else. It was, was you guys. Yeah. It was you. And if you guys negotiated. You sat here with us and negotiated it. We all sat around the big square table and we negotiated the new health insurance. I think that was in 2012. I remember it. <coughs> Rick Wall was representing the union. He wasn't chief then. Yeah, Rick, it was Rick Wall. Right. It was George for the fire department. I was for the, the courts. Kevin Betts was for the DPW. And, um, you were the seniors, you know, you were the seniors. And he wanted to know who was going to stick up for his seniors. And we said, we'll take a bigger hit to make sure that they're covered. And you all guys thought, that was great. I don't know what could it do. I don't know what could it do any of us came up to 25. How many retirees are there, Ed? Do you have the count? Total, it's over 140. It's only 22, I believe, under this bill. There's, uh, I believe there's 140 counting the school department. And they're at 25. Now what about those if, if you make a decision to allow these to go at what they, what they retired at? Does that mean that we have to go back to the school department and all of those people that retired before this was put into effect, can go the back to 15. What's that? The school, the teachers. Well, I believe that I believe I was told it was 22 people to compromise. That would have been compromises. Also, I believe three of those uh, reached the age of 65. Yeah. And now go on to Medicare, so it's a huge one. Hmm. It's a declining list. Ed, can I ask you a, a practical question? Maybe it's a, a legal question. If we selectively chose uh, certain people fell into a certain category, 
and gave them a different rate than other retirees? Is, is that possible or legal? In your opinion, you're not a lawyer, I know. I don't know if you would be under the gun to amend everybody else's contribution ratio. If you just picked out people that, certain people out of the total number of early retirees. How about this? <clears throat> because in, I take Bill's point well that we're, we're trying to be fair to everyone across the board. We, you know, um, trying to get everyone up equal to 25%. To There's no secret about that. That's what, that's been our goal. Matter of fact, this Board of Selectmen's uh, minutes from 2006, they've been trying to do that since 2006. So we want that, even for retirees, eventually. But yeah. if, there, if there is a way to have, um, uh, Ed, maybe you can help us with this and maybe with the language of what I'm trying to say, is a pool, a hardship pool that someone could apply for to have a reduction uh, in their percentage. Do you know how many people still covered under this? Is it 22? I don't know. I asked. And I had the, uh, Kathleen had that list. I so. think it's 22 people. On this sheet, she says it's 20. 20 people? 20. That account for the couple that George said retired. Said they they said they retired. Retired. <laughs> so, uh, one thing I, I would like to do uh, going forward is have everyone the same. Everyone at 25 percent, but if there's a way to have uh, some kind of hardship exemption that someone can apply for, in it, it would be possible that the folks that are really affected, uh, if we could set up a mechanism for that, could have their rates reduced, and that way the board isn't isn't doing it selectively on our own. It's um, the reduction in rates, we do it. We do it with our, our taxes uh, on your on your property tax. There's there's a method to do that. Uh, we did it for another uh, insurance issue a couple of years back. Ed, um, I can't recall the circumstance, uh, but you understand the what what I'm, what I'm going for. That would effectively help us as a board reach our goal of having everyone at 25 percent. And it will help the folks that it's real that are really being squeezed by what we voted for. But if we only have twenty people left on the list, maybe the <coughs> is at twenty five percent. Yeah, but they're not. See a lot of these unions don't go to their twenty five percent till uh, two thousand nineteen. So that that that's what we were trying to be fair to them also when we negotiated so with them to say that they went to that percentage and then they go into this percentage the following year and the last three year contract we had. And I think it's 2019 is that everybody should be on 25. How about anybody who retired prior to July 1st of 2017? That's when the letter went out. That's when it changed. Yeah, again, it, it's, it's, it's a decision of this board. We, you know, we we could have we 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 could have changed it at any time. We could change it again at any time, but we, we have the we have the we can. Doesn't mean we will. Somebody from this group should have been notified when this was happening. Nobody knew about this. This was happening. I was told, why didn't you come to the meeting? I was asked, why weren't you at the meeting? So I wasn't told about the meeting. I'm not hard to find. I'm in the office next door. Yeah, and, and we would have the same discussion, uh, Peg and George, then. I wish we, I wish we could um, I wish we could because then we wouldn't be six months down the line with people calling saying, what's going on, what's going on, and waiting six months for you to tell me what's going on. Sure. Well, to Dan's point, I don't see the problem necessarily in drawing up a criteria for a hardship, if you're going to call it that. But I think we have to have some hard and fast rules as to what constitutes a hardship, what percentage of increase, uh, you know, like a circuit breaker um, would be in a, um, you know, uh, funds coming to the town from the state, for example. So if we could do something like that, you may find out that of the 20 remaining, it applies to six 
or it applies to four, and um, you know make it um, you know make it fair and equitable that you know because everybody frankly who's affected uh, at all even in small dollars is going to say it affects me you know in a negative way and you know clearly it doesn't increase in your health insurance is a negative but you know is it so much so that you're going to you know lose a house or you know um, go bankrupt over it it's, it's not worth it and I, I would agree with Peg you know that when we're, we're not that kind of town that um, we can't take a second look and it may be that we can't do anything about it but at least we've you know, turned over the last uh, the last stone. I, th I think we should work toward that goal quickly. Yeah, because they paid it, some of these people have paid a thousand dollars since June, July, just to, more, more just to keep their home. And when we're talking about, we're not talking about big pocket pensions. We're talking about small pocket pension, the small pockets. It's twenty-five thousand is probably the highest that pensions. I think we need to check with town council to find out if that also applies to everybody in the town <coughs> and if it also applies um, to the school because the school's already paying to <coughs> Well, I know, but there could be some people on the school that weren't paying 25 when they retired. So, and I'm not sure whether, you know, were they paying 25%? The, 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 the way the school works, um, school employees, there's two groups of school employees. Most of them are paid by teacher's retirement. There are three categories, I believe, three categories of school employees that are from the county retirees. That's the secretaries, the custodians, and maybe it's just going with the other child. Maybe it's just those two. Everybody else is um, under the rules of the teacher's retirement. Well, we have the list of everybody that's either being paid under Mass Teachers Retirement or, you know, that are not eligible for that. We have we have all that. The Treasurer's Office I has think all I have, that. I have the custodians, the secretarial, the new IT techs, going to put in the county to the Teachers Retirement. All Teachers Retirement employees My question, yeah. I, the GCI the state says that you have to have representatives for your retirees. When you're meeting and discussing rates for retirees, why wasn't the representative included? If the state that, says you have to have that, that requirement's for the Insurance Advisory Committee. This is not the Insurance Advisory Committee. But wouldn't that representative have information that might be pertinent to your decision? Well, and you, this as you said, you can do what you want. So even if you have the representative there, it doesn't mean you can't still do what you want. That's a point well taken. And we, we, we should have invited uh, you or someone to represent the retirees at, at that meeting. Um, you know, uh, poor excuse for us, but it, it was advertised. But we should have uh, reached out and brought you in. And we will. Uh, the next time we discuss an open session, any anything to do with your retirement. So it's it's a mistake that we'll try not to do again. So what do I tell these people? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, back in March when we made this decision to increase the percentage, uh, we may not have had all the information uh, but we made the decision, and we all know the reasons why we made it. The cost of health insurance is killing the town, and everybody is paying more. People in the private sector are also paying more. It's just a, a general issue across the country. Now, I like Dan's suggestion. Um, 
I about looking into creating we'll use the hardship term so that if you were going to be paying whatever the rate was 20 percent 25 percent and we had a criteria set up where someone could apply to not pay that rate but pay a lesser rate I'd be interested in exploring that because I understand what you're saying about the hardship issues that some of our people are facing with our decision that we made in March. Um, we would have to look into that uh, with our legal folks. Uh, it may be a simple question and get a simple answer, but they don't usually work out that way. But I would be in favor of exploring that. and. Um, I would think we could get a decision on whether that can even be approached, it could even be done. I don't know whether the board would vote to do that or not, but I would like to look at that. So Thank that would uh, be my suggestion, Mr. Chairman. Appreciate that. Okay, we'll It's really for a single person, for an early t retiree, the rate, the difference right now is $150 that they're paying, and if they were at 15%, it's 119 So we're talking about $30. It's a family. It's a family. Right. For it's family, family, it is 402 versus 317 what were they for six months ago? What were they three months ago? 317. Not at 402. But then they're going to get another hike again in January. Well, I'm, I'm just saying what, what yeah. the difference between 14, I mean 15% and 19% is. They're going to get another hike in January. That's per month? Pardon? That's per month, correct. And remember, the town's paying 81 percent of the, somebody's premium, which is a pretty good deal. You know, you don't see that in the private sector, so and that's why actually we're getting employees from other towns because other towns are charging 50-50, and we're only charging 75-25 for active employees. So, but anyway, the difference for early retiree couple and a uh, at 15 and is, uh, you know, 195, 90, 90 bucks a month. So uh, I, to your point, Ed, we're looking at, we have a, we have a list of con health insurance contribution rates for 20 towns nearby us and similar to us in size. And we're at the. We're we make our employees pay the, the least of anyone. Second least. Except for Hanson. Se well, yeah. yeah Except for Hanson. Yeah, that's the point I brought up when I asked the first mm -hmm. question. Nine of them on that list are paying the 50 50. But Marshfield pays 50 50. Yeah. Yeah. I think the only hope we have of tying this up over the next week or two weeks is to come up with some type of plan if there is such a thing, um, you know, that would be deemed legal by Kaufman and Page uh, to institute a, uh, an exemption program, as Dan called it, you know, with some kind of circuit breaker number uh, in terms of percentage of uh, the person's uh, pension versus their contribution. So I, I think there may be a way to settle this. Not, it's not going to make everybody 100% happy, but it may make 50% of the people 50% happy. Right. So w we absolutely, as a board, want to go forward having everyone, including retirees, pay 25%. But we also appreciate 
people that have worked for our towns their, their whole life and don't want to make someone broke in their retirement when they're most vulnerable. So we, sh we should look for a way to, to have a circuit breaker and exemption for those folks that, that really need it. And, and I think that's, that's the way to, to, to settle it, at least to, to look into it uh, going forward. <coughs> Um, do we need a motion to that effect, or is that something that the we can move to can table, table for a week? Table for a week and um, to give the administrator the opportunity. It's a back for you by next week. Yeah, could you do that, Ed? Mm -hmm. uh, motion to table this discussion for one week. Second. Second. Mm -hmm. uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody Aye. opposed? We'll be back next Monday. Okay. Right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next thing up on the board action items is a uh, vote to adopt amendment to traffic rules and orders of the town and add Valley and Birch Street HCVE truck exclusion. Isn't that your, uh, your thing, Mr. Stone? That's yeah. my baby. That's your baby there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Massachusetts Department of Transportation has approved Pembroke's and Duxbury's request for a 24-hour heavy commercial vehicle exclusion on Valley and Birch Street. Um, this board must vote to amend the traffic rules of the town. And uh, under the terms of this, uh, our DPW would provide signing and our police chief would be responsible for the enforcement. Now, on Valley Street, we have a bog which uh, occasionally has heavy duty vehicles uh, removing or receiving uh, things. That is not gonna be affected by this exclusion. That is regulated by a special group of rules established by the Board of Selectmen. Um, on Birch Street, we have a uh, 40B building project going on. Uh, the necessary vehicles to complete that project would be exempt from this particular ruling. Uh, we have agreed with the developer on several traffic routes to alleviate one or two streets having all of those trucks. So this is for other vehicles who are using these two streets basically as a shortcut to get from Route 53 to Route 27 or vice versa. Uh, we have highways to handle these vehicles. Our streets are not built uh, to handle them. They're too narrow, there's no sidewalks. Uh, it's created quite a hazard. I would like to thank the town administrator, the chief of police, and Josh Cutler for assisting us in uh, obtaining this exclusion. So having said that, if there are no questions, I would make a motion, Mr. Chairman, to amend the traffic rules and orders of the town of Pembroke Section 15, operation of heavy commercial vehicles to add Valley Street from Plain Street to the Duxbury Town Line and Birch Street from Pelham Street to the Duxbury Town Line. Second. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, and all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And there's, um, there's probably a bunch of um, more streets that people have their eye on that don't want the heavy vehicles uh, going up and down their streets either. So. Yeah, but w one thing, we please keep an eye, the rest of the board, uh, the, the law of unintended consequences, be because as you close certain streets, the vehicle 
uh, pushed to other streets. So while this, these streets named here today and the ones we've done previously were important and needed to be done, we just have to be careful not to do it to too many because there are unintended consequences that can happen. So just be cognizant of that. Okay, next thing up on the agenda is consider request to renew door-to-door -door solicitation permit <coughs> David Babbitt, Comcast, expires November 21st. Hi, thank you for having Hi. us. Um, I wasn't here for the last meeting. My name is Ray Dantello. This is David Babb. Um, David was granted a solicitation permit um, the last time that they attended here with another representative. Um, and we're here to ask for a renewal of that solicitation permit. Uh, we've been in the town soliciting for three months now. Happy to report that we have signed up approximately a dozen customers. Brand new customers come over to us from the Dish or Direct television. Um, we were able to save some of those folks a good amount of money between forty to eighty dollars. Um, on top of that, some of those customers are experiencing service issues with Direct TV or AT and T of Verizon Internet Service. So they're able to come over to us, and um, the quality of the service has, has been good for them. We also had two customers that um, weren't able to get Comcast services in the past. Um, and David um, was able to work with them and work with our field folks and actually get the service brought to their home at no cost to the customer. Um, so feeling like we've made some good ground. Um, we do have the permit until 7 p.m. at night right now. It's from 11.30 to 7, well it just expired, 11.30 to 7. With the evening hours, you know, our daylight hours are shorter if we are going to get an, an, um, an approval to get the permit back to reduce those hours down to 5 o'clock, so maybe it's 10 to 5, so that we're not out there as late into the evening when it's dark out. Because it gets dark at 4.30 now. So. Yeah, yeah. 4.30, 5, yeah. Good. We're more, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's better for, we find in towns people are more comfortable when we're out there and it's not, you know, really late into the evening. We've had no issues with Comcast, have we? None no. that I'm aware of. None that I'm aware of. No, well, that brings us closer to negotiations with the town. That would be great. I government relations unfortunately couldn't make it tonight, but I did speak to him beforehand, and things are moving in the right direction. Yeah. Good. We were actually looking for an early sign up for the town too. Yes. Yeah. He informed me. Of that. A decrease in the monthly cost of cable. <laughs> it's a car payment <laughs> nowadays. It is. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, if you'd accept the motion. Yes. Move to approve the application of David Babb on behalf of Comcast for a door to door solicitation permit authorizing sales from uh, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Please, yes. Uh, Monday through Friday and from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. on Saturday and Sunday. License eligible for renewal on its expiration on February 21st. Uh, 2018, subject to approval in permit card issuance by the Chief of Police. Second. Do you have any questions or comments? Yeah, I, I have a, good, a general comment on, on the system, this new bylaw that we have uh, that uh, allows door-to-door uh, -door, door -door solicitation uh, with a permit card from the Chief of Police. Uh, it, it makes it clear that when someone has the card, and has been vetted by the chief of police. Uh, it, it's safe. Uh, the person is known, and uh, it's it's better for for the community. It's it's a it's a good system, and there's less less danger to to the residents in town. So I'm, I'm glad we went to this fully vetted, permitted system. I would agree. And I will say the, the permits that we have through the town also have our pictures on them. So if any residents do question, you know, that we just want to hand a permit by somebody else, they, our pictures are on the permits as well. Yeah, great. It's not something that we get in every town. So that's, that right. is very good. Okay. Uh, when you do do go to these door to door, are you in proper attire that advertise? <laughs> I'm uh, dressed as, as I am today. Also? Yeah. yeah. And then my, we do have our, our Comcast badges and then the Pembroke badge as yeah. well. Okay, very good. 
Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Yes. Opposed. One opposed. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Accept the minutes of November 20th, 2017. Mr. Chairman, I, I will not be voting on the minutes as I was absent last week. I will move the minutes as submitted. Second. Any questions or comments? Okay, none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Anybody opposed? One abstaining from voting. Thank you. We have a Vote to renew annual common victims of license subject to approval of the town treasurer and health agent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, uh, after our last meeting, I uh, referred the action of the board to Sabrina, and she suggested that you don't need to read every one of these license applications. Yeah, there is quite a few of them. <laughs> Uh, with, with that being said, Mr. Chairman, uh, move to approve the renewal of the list of the 2018 common biddlers licenses as submitted, subject to the approval of the town treasurer and health agent. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Um, record of approved bills and payroll for November 28th. And that would be me. That um, record of the actions of the board uh, designee on 11-28-17. I'm pleased to report that <coughs> I personally reviewed nine accounts payable warrants totaling $841,304.22 and two payroll warrants totaling $1,411,191.21. cents prepared by the town accountant and authorize the itemized expenditures for payment, and it's signed by me. Motion to accept. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Good. We'll get those bills paid off. Uh, do we have a town administrator's report? Uh, one quick item. Uh, Mr. Stone requested that I update the board as to the status of the solar project on Hoppermock Street. And I will paraphrase the uh, email sent from Brian DeMeo of uh, Onyx Renewables to Mr. Mike Bellini and myself, and uh, uh, as well as uh, uh, Nick Sakello Jr. Uh, I am pleased to inform you that the utility witness verification test required for the system to become operational was successfully completed on Thursday, November the 30th. Uh, we expect the formal permission to operate from the utility by the end of next week. So uh, we expect the system to be online with National Grid uh, at the end of next week. Awesome. That's good news. Uh, anything else? No, sir. A uh, quick thing, Ed, while well, you're at the town administrator's report, uh, we asked you to can to look into conducting a, a townwide survey uh, last week, right, which stemmed from a discussion in, at the retreat that we had. That's correct. I'm working with uh, the person that put on the uh, retreat um, to sit down and go over a survey that would be um, would be unique for Pembroke. Um, right now, she prepared a draft that was similar to one that she did for Marshfield, and obviously, we don't want it people in Pembroke to think that they have to choose between Brant Rock and Marshville Hills as to where they, you know, why they moved to the town of Pembroke. So uh, we're going to make the survey that will fit the town of Pembroke. And when we're, when we're, when we're finished with that draft, then I'll share it with the Board of Select. I just want to make sure I was moving. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, going back to the uh, old business just for a minute, um, what I'd like to do is uh, tell advise uh, the board and also the townspeople that uh, I met with um, one of the Brockton's water commissioners the other day and uh, we went down and viewed the site 
of the um, area where the diversion uh, took place and explain uh, to him um, that how this had been going on for quite a while. Uh, I received a um, call from the Division of Marine Fisheries indicating that he received a call to set up a meeting as soon as possible with Brockton to talk about the issues and try to get this resolved uh, quickly. Um, also uh, uh, took a walk with the uh, a lot of concerned people in, down in the Silver Lake and observed the Jones River um, entrance from Silver Lake. Uh, there's no way the water could ever get down through there, um, especially now. Um, but there's a lot of concern from uh, North South River Watershed Association, the Jones River. Um, also, the, um, the people that work with the Heron Fisheries um, in Massachusetts were concerned, and they're actually going to put out a, a news release on it, um, which I think is trying to make everybody aware of um, that this is something that not only Pembroke, but all of the towns need to watch a little bit stricter as to what's going on with the fish and, um, and how it's working out. He actually even got a call from um, a guy that is uh, investigating and working on uh, offshore fisheries that the draggers are um, too close inshore that are picking up fish too. So um, seems like a big effort of a lot of people putting a lot of time and effort into uh, trying to save these fish. So, so it's a good thing. It's uh, hopefully we haven't seen any results yet, but um, I'm hoping to hear from Brad Chase from the Division of Marine Fisheries soon to find out um, if and when uh, Brockton supposedly has not been diverting any water since the 1st of May, uh, and they still haven't diverted uh, yet this year. Um, they have not diverted because of the fact that uh, we sent them a letter from the Board of Selectmen indicating that we didn't want them to divert until they fix the problem that's down there. So it seems to, a lot of people seems to uh, raise their eyebrows and they're, they're kind of looking at it a little stronger than, uh, than usual. So, and not to leave out Abington and Rockland, there's, there's, um, I think that's something that has to be looked at also about uh, taking water. Um, and I understand that they have permits in to even take more water than what they're taking and to It's not going to be much more to take. That's right. Uh, if they take more than what they're taking now, um, but they also approved uh, a bunch of different condo units, uh, oh, there's 250 condo units and all that that's going to be sucking up a lot of water that, um, and I don't know where they're getting their water from other than they think they're going to get it from Furnace Pond. So, um, this is this is all something that we're depleting our natural resources here, and it's it's not a good thing between Silver Lake and the local ponds that are around here. It's it really needs uh, something needs to be done to save it. So hopefully we can we can get something on the good side of all of this, uh, even if we have to go to the legislature and uh, repetition that article that was that was put in there years ago and change it. That, I don't particularly think that there should be any diversion at all during migration. And uh, uh, the 2,500 fish that were found dead, from what I understand, we're talking to the neighbors down there. There was there was over 50 swans eating them, um, a ton of geese that were down there eating them, plus a lot of other birds and massive amounts of seagulls that were that were diving on fish on Silver Lake. So we have no idea how many went in there. And we don't even know how they get in there because if Brockton was not diverting since the 1st of May, I have no idea how these juvenile fish get in there. So it's, it's maybe there's a leaky pipe or it's open, the gate is open over there that you can't really see or whatever it is, but, but there's, uh, they get in there somehow. And we have no idea knowing how many there is, so. Um, so anyway, we just brought that up to 
to uh, let everybody know that it's still going on and we're working on it. And like I said, I've been meeting with uh, with some people over it. So the other thing was that um, I answered a call from somebody, they called the Selectman's office um, about the Route 14 project. They're not very happy with, with um, the way things are going. It's actually a, a house that's across the street from here that uh, they were promised that no trees would be taken off of their property. And from what I understand, there's a, quite a few trees that were taken off of their property. And um, so I told them that I would talk to Ed and also um, the state and uh, Landis about what's going on and how they're going to um, recoup this, this uh, woman for her loss on her property. So, Was the trees on her property? Because a lot of people believe that they own to the street, but that's not the case. It's a combination right. of both. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Chairman, yeah. uh, we've been, Ed and I have been meeting with uh, the DPW and the state who's in charge of this project, uh, Route 14. And uh, they have been telling us that they are meeting with the resident and um, they've had meetings, several meetings, and have gone over all of those issues. And at the last meeting, which was uh, last Friday, they said they had an architect involved. So just for a point of information, they are working with her. Doesn't mean they're going to solve everything. Yeah. But at least they have been meeting with her. Well, at least she was looking for the town to um to give her some relief, and I said it's not a town project; it's a state project, and um, so she's unhappy with with what has taken place so far. So hopefully, maybe that they can um, that they can make her happy. Uh, I know they're going to build a wall up over there, mm -hmm. um, and I know that they had talked about replacing some trees over there. But she would like to have it in um, in written form and all that because she was told originally that by a person in the town that no trees would be cut down off of her property. So mm. um, so it's just something that um, I told her that I would check with Ed and whoever else is involved in it. Though. She claims that they're not keeping in contact with her and when she calls that they're not answering her calls and not calling her back. So that was her statement to me today. So listening to both Ed and you, it seems like mm. She has been working with them, so uh, hopefully everybody can come out of this uh, on the right side. Mr. Chairman, I had two items under old business. Okay. Uh, on November 6th, we uh, voted to establish the Capital Funding Study Committee composed of nine people, and I was wondering uh, how we are coming along with uh, getting people to form that committee if we've got a list of people or I don't think we've gotten any uh photograph away but your resident volunteer hasn't stepped forward yet. You could make a nice pitch right now. Get somebody in from yeah. the public. Well we have uh we have identified advisory committee, the board of selectmen, community center task force, department of public works, fire department, planning board, police department, school committee, and one member of the general public. So uh, most of the of those groups would be responsible for assigning someone. Right, but we're they're all waiting to see who the member of the general public will be. Okay. So it's a pro it's a uh, project in progress. Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, my second uh, issue, I would like to request that uh, uh, Ed at a subsequent meeting of the board of selectmen uh, give us an update on where we are with the uh, financial management review conducted by the Department of Revenue. About a year ago, uh, Ed gave us an update of where we were, and we had completed 24 of the issues that were identified. There's still a few pending, and uh, I'd, I'd like to get a, I hope will be a final report on uh, the DOR 
so it'll be about as did. final as we can do. So okay, and right. It's it's completed and it'll be on your agenda next Monday night. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. Mr. Chairman, I have one one item under new business. Okay. So this going back to that plan a few months back that I was speaking of uh, taking a few town parcels that are being under maintained and allowing the Chamber of Commerce, Commerce to step forth and help us maintain those. Just want to give you guys an update. So Sabrina and I have been talking with the DPW zoning boards and historic commission, try to get everyone on the same page and making good progress with that. Okay. Mr. Chairman, while you have business on the mind here um, in the Chamber of Commerce, I'd just like to remind folks that we just gave common victual licenses to about three dozen uh, businesses here, predominantly restaurants and fast food places, but there were retailers as well in the, um, you know, the Pembroke downtown area and along the um, 139 corridor and so forth. That we go to them, we as parents and school parents go to them uh, every year for donations and um, looking for money for yearbooks and uniforms and things like that. This is our chance to pay them back. This is the uh, one month that we get to uh, really spend uh, heavy on the retail businesses. So I would just encourage people, if you're going to get, uh, you know, we're going to buy Dan a gift certificate for dinner, we get it from someplace in Pembroke rather than go to the Hanover Mall. And it's closer for him to enjoy it. And we take care of a local business at the same time. Very good. The other, the other thing is, too, is that we still offer this on Monday nights for <coughs> Um, businesses from Pembroke um, that are members of the Chamber of Commerce and all that that want to come in and talk about their business here. Um, we'll get you on the agenda right off at 7 o'clock. Uh, and um, a lot of people haven't uh, taken that into, into consideration to, to come forward and uh, let the public know what they do in their business. So it's still open. We look forward to having them. Right. Mr. Chairman, uh, another item of new business. Uh, we got an email from the Plymouth County Advisory Board telling us that there will be a meeting Thursday, December 7th uh, in, uh, at their uh, administration building in Plymouth. And uh, do we have, uh, will we be represented, I guess is my question. And which, that was from... Um Um, I thought you were on that. Don't you on that for the Plymouth County? Yeah, Matthew's our designee. Yeah, oh, I am. You're our designee. There is a on the seventh. <coughs> I think I should be able to make that. Yeah. So it'd be nice to find out what they're doing down there and let us know. Yeah. Awesome. Can do that. Yeah, I think they're looking for us to notify them as well. Okay. So, did you want to keep this then? Going? Yeah, they have sure. a, a board that's weighted by percentage of population, right. and they like to get an idea ahead of time whether they're going to make a quorum or not. Because while we've been very diligent as the town of Pembroke at showing up at these meetings, there are other cities and towns in Plymouth County that have not been quite as cooperative. Good. Um, so, under, under new business, you still on that, Bill? Sure. I just want the board to know that uh, the Town Government Study Committee has been meeting. Uh, we had a meeting last week, and we voted to propose a town meeting, an annual town meeting warrant article to propose a town manager form of government in town. Uh, we still have some more research to do on the best way to, to write the article and present it to the town, the departments, uh, the public. I, so I just wanted the, this board to know that uh, that is that is coming soon. You will see a presentation from the Town Government Study Committee uh, fairly shortly. Uh, but I wanted you to know that some action will be taken and we will be uh, having a proposed warrant article coming before us. So and if anyone wants to join in the discussion, uh, you're welcome to join us. I'll, I'll let you know our next meeting date once it's set. Uh, one other thing is uh, 
now that we have successfully uh, established a solar farm, which as Ed has told us will be activated very soon, uh, we've been looking into maybe additional solar sites where they look to be a benefit to the town uh, to keep uh, cutting into our electrical costs, saving money for the town. And um, as I mentioned to Ed earlier this week, uh, well, last week, um, the uh, Energy Committee has been a real solid group who have helped us on the solar farm, and they have all kinds of knowledge about it. I would really like to give the chairman a call if the board would agree and uh, see what we can do to go after uh, any additional sites. For example, over on uh, Four, Four Wind Drive, uh, looks like we could put some panels there. Uh, but there's a long process that has to go through. Uh, they are, DPW would be amenable, amenable to um, get some power over there for the uh, water plant, and uh, that would be a good project. And uh, maybe perhaps something on the library roof. Uh, we haven't looked at that at all. But the point is, uh, if there was a couple of other sites that would make sense and save more money for the town, uh, I'd like to contact the chairman of the Energy Committee and uh, pass that by him. I've had discussions with him all, already, but haven't put any plans in place. So uh, that's what I'm proposing. Well, that sounds good. Uh, just to be clear, you were talking about windswept box as opposed to full winds drive, right? Sabrina hopes so. Yeah. Well, uh, you sure you didn't mean uh, <laughs> Water Street, Roxanne Road? <laughs> Where else did you want them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was offering up my, my yard. <laughs> well, I just wonder what the standards are because that's a that's a bog that's grown over basically and there's not a lot of upland there that's publicly owned so I don't know what the rules are as far as you know doing construction in there mm -hmm. and I would expect most of my neighbors would probably not be thrilled to <laughs> to see it well I think it's a point well taken uh, the spot that comes to my mind I know it's involved the schools and so kind of involved holding the committee, but putting them on top of the school buildings, I think, would make the most sense to me. Yeah, we ju I did have a, a very brief conversation with the superintendent about that, and uh, they mentioned uh, uh, pieces of equipment that are already on the roofs of the schools. I haven't looked at it or anything. Um, there was a little bit of interest, but I think we could go back and talk about it again. Yeah. Well, we sure do have a lot of land in Pembroke. Maybe yeah, we could consider it. Well, we've had such good luck with the solar farm, although it's taken a lot longer than I had envisioned. Um, <clears throat> we are going to save a lot of money on the cost of electricity, but it's not 100%. I'd like to look at 100% if we could if we could do it, but we need to look at it a lot closer. Okay, any other business? Every night we have some upcoming issues on December 11th. We have a public hearing, uh, renewable and eligible license applicants, and all app, app classifications. Uh, also on December 11th. We have 30 liquor licenses, 11 live entertainment, um, 5 Sunday amusement devices, and license renewals. Um, also set the Selectman's winter schedule uh, break. December 18th, discuss the Selectman's 2018 calendar. 
and on January 22nd, an uh, open annual town meeting warrant. Is there a need for executive session tonight? Uh, there is, Mr. Chairman. Uh, under Mass General Laws 30A, Section 21, reason number one to discuss complaints or charges brought against the public officer, employee, staff member, or individual, and uh, reason number seven to comply with or uh, act under the authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements, specifically General Law Chapter 268A, Section 20. And uh, reason number two, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with non-union personnel, or uh, to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel, assistant to the town administrator. Second. Okay, and I do have to declare, uh, which I don't see in the end, but uh, I'm sure that I have to declare that. So I will declare that. Is there um, any other questions or comments about this? Here now we'll be coming back to uh, open session. You may. To uh, make a vote? Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. There's a possibility of uh, coming back in open session to make a vote uh, for the public. So um, we will retire into executive session as soon as we take the vote, and we will be coming back into open session possibly to uh, take a vote. So all those in favor, by roll call? Yes. 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 And I say yes. So that will uh, conclude most of all of the business tonight, except if we do come back into open session to uh, take a vote. So uh, we will recess into executive session at this time.